Good afternoon. Um, I think after that great presentation from Alan, I, I think I now call myself an amateur professional. Yes. I think that's it. I'm just going to use that. Okay. Um, elections. We've had a few. Um, and on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, for those that don't know me, I'm from Britain originally. I now work in America, so I get the joy of two lots of complete messes. Um, but I find them cartographically kind of interesting to see how the results get presented um, at each time, each round of elections, to see what the trends are, what people are trying to map, how they're trying to map. Um, as a previous British Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, once said, a week is a long time in politics, and um, I think that actually is true for cartography as well, uh, because change is, is absolutely rapid at the moment, really fast pace of change in the type and style of maps that we're seeing, uh, and elections tend to help to breed that uh, change. So in 2010, somewhere here, um, most of the um, maps in the British election were um, fairly standard, um, but that was perhaps one of the first elections where um, the result was too complex to call. The polls were completely wrong. They then predicted the wrong outcome in 2015. Uh, the subsequent 2016 Brexit, Brexit uh, referendum, uh, the 2016 US presidential election, the polls um, were, were pretty out of, um, out of kilter. And um, all the way over there on the, the recent UK general election, our Prime Minister Theresa May got it gloriously wrong. Um, so how do, we, how do we map this? And what we're going to have a look at um, in this session is just some of the examples and um, some of my attempts. But first I thought we would uh, define what a map is. <laughs> <coughs> and um, in the nasus tradition of standing up, is John Nelson in the room? Thank you, John. Uh, this is John's niece when she was eight. Eight cartography runs in the family, obviously. And um, so this was her. I, I love this. Um, and here's, here's another. Uh, here's a guy. Um, he likes maps. Anyway, everyone purports to love maps, okay? Everybody. Um, even this guy, particularly colourful ones that reflect uh, political affiliations with political party colours. We see them everywhere. Um, and we use these maps, and these guys use these maps to tell particular stories, to be become part of the political narrative. And we see this everywhere. So maps take centre stage. They're, they give us a trusted mechanism. Um, they can be used for persuasion. They can be used for propaganda. And, of course, there's no more better an example than in the political arena. Um, but, of course, the problem is it's very difficult to know what's true <laughs> and, um, and what is... What is fake anymore? Um, it's very difficult to spot it if you're not well attuned to looking out for these issues. Um, maps have always lied, okay? Um, perhaps with technology, it's easier than ever to make a map to tell your particu particular version of the truth. So although this was entitled fake maps, it's, this is more about alternate realities and realities that support your particular version of whatever truth it is you want to, to uh, display but also um, perhaps to convince your reader of the truth that you want them to believe. So it's probably of no surprise when we saw this across our social media um, a few months ago with uh, Reuters quoting uh, President Trump as saying, here you can take that, that's the final map of the numbers, it's pretty good right, the red is obviously us. And um, yeah, we might chuckle at that, but there's nothing wrong with that map. The map is correct, okay? It's just one way to display the results of, of the election. Um, but we all know this sort of choropleth map can be used to warp a view of reality. And of course, this one suits this particular narrative, and we might choose other forms. So let's look at a little his, his, history. Um, the map on the left is possibly the first attempt in the UK in 1895 um, to warp conventional physical geography. Um, over on the right, the 1964-1966 attempt. What we've really got is a gridded cartogram and a population equalizing cartogram over there, really early attempts to warp British geography to map people rather than geography. And then we bring it up to uh, slightly more current in the 1980s, Danny Dawling um, um, famously invented his own little circular cartogram, but played with it as a structure on which to put swing type maps, uh, chair and off faces and various other techniques. 
Um, so experimentation has been rife amongst political maps. Um, this map over on the left is the 2010 UK general election results. We have way more than just red and blue. We have all sorts of bizarre, weird creatures that uh, uh, stand for elections in the UK. So we need a bigger, richer color palette. Um, but of course, you can see on the left here that the colors dominate the map. Over on the right is the gridded cartogram version um, of exactly the same data. And visually, it equalizes for um, some of the problems that the geography gives us. Um, and I, I, it was nice that Alan said, you know, we tried to stay away from cartograms. But uh, in the recent um, British elections, cartograms have been absolutely the most uh, trusted mechanism. It's pretty much the only map that people use is the gridded hexagonal cartogram. This is from um, the Independent newspaper. They had an online offering over here on the left, and that was their print map over on the right. Interestingly, though, they went with the cartogram on their web offering first, but they went with a geography or a geographical map in their print offering. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But of course, it's not just the print media. This is the, the BBC um, decided to make a map for everyone to walk over. Um, and they placed little physical hexagons in each of the constituencies as the results came in on election night. And then in the aftermath, uh, this is the Guardian, the British newspaper, the Guardian, uh, went into a little more detail. But again, hexagons. Um, but they used it in fairly inventive ways to provide a fairly rich, fairly compelling, uh, complete cartographic surface um, on the night and also to allow you to dig in a little more deeply afterwards to explore some of the nuance in the election, uh, to show the majority vote, the turnout, uh, the vote share by party, and even the sort of swing um, in Scotland, particularly in the 20... Uh, I'm, I'm losing my dates now, 2015. Um, it was massive uh, away from the Labour Party um, towards the Scottish National Party, um, that massive swing from left to right. And, of course... It wouldn't be me if I didn't put any stupid maps up here. So um, <laughs> it, it, it spawned some fantastic other little cartographic <laughs> niceties. <coughs> some frivolous, some humorous, but all I think which sort of adds to this idea that you can map elections in, in many different ways. And I, I did the same for the 2015 election. I've shown these before, so I'll just very briefly talk about this Jackson Pollock style map where I just threw paint at the, uh, the canvas. I played around with 3D just because I'm never convinced that 3D is a great idea. I'm still not. And I proved that by doing the same for the Brexit referendum, which is just awful. So um, I'm Ken. I'm a cartographer. This is a terrible map. Um, OK, so a little bit about the British election. Let's, let's switch gears to um, somewhere I'm not familiar with, so I apologize. Um, this is perhaps the first US election map, 1883, map of the 1880 election. Um, it's a choropleth, okay? It's a, it's a typical representation of, um, of the geography of the election. And we bring it right up to date, and this, was the, um, this is a selection from New York Times, Daily Kos, Wall Street Journal, NPR, Washington Post, um, with different approaches to mapping the results of the 2016 election. Uh, and I think you'd agree, even if you don't like them, the, the variety there is, is really quite fantastic. I just want to pick up on one or two, uh, in what, I, what I felt were perhaps special maps or maps that uh, were a little bit different to what we'd seen before. And this was a great little map, well, it was a big map, in the Washington Post, uh, sort of mountains across the landscape with the peaks drawn with a line thickness to emphasize voting strength, um, sort of a proportional symbol uh, vibe going on here. But what I really liked on, about this is the uh, orientation of the map. The map was, uh, was positioned, rotated 90 degrees, so east was up and west was down, uh, north was left and south was right. Um, and that, fit, that fitted the, um, the device delivery perfectly because you were going to scroll up a screen or a mobile device, and as you moved up and down, then the map of the states was oriented in, in, in terms of the actual um, device rather than the paper. I thought 538 did a nice job. Uh, it's not a map, but down in that bottom right-hand corner, um, uh, before the result was called, you'll notice. Um, but a really nice way of showing where that line uh, is crossed when a particular candidate has got, has got the required number of electoral college votes. Um, the point here being, often maps don't actually tell the story at all, and a graph is a better way of displaying uh, the information. 
And we have the usual dot dense, uh, dosimetric dot density map. Um, you know, as, as they all do, they show where we live. I thought, um, <laughs> I thought this was particularly interesting. This is the Financial Times um, <coughs> attempting to try an innovative solution, uh, which they themselves refer to as the compromise. Um, in effect, what they've tried to do is take the best components. So they've got a geographical framework on there, and that's the underlying framework on which they hang the symbology of effectively some sort of um, dot density. It's a slightly portion symbol style map, but each dot represents one electoral college. So you end up getting visually the equivalent amount of sort of blue and red ink across the map with the geographical context behind it. So it's not perhaps as um, visually... Um, disturbing as a, as a pure cartogram that everyone just goes, what's that? I can't find where I am. Um, so I like, I like this. Um, you will probably expect me to put this map up as well because it's a beautiful map. Uh, Tim's map, um, Tim Wallace's map in the New York Times, beautifully imagined um, Trump's America and uh, Clinton's America. But the interesting thing about the New York Times is they went ahead and did this as well. Um, a beautiful sort of double gatefold out of the print edition of the New York Times, which uh, uh, I think one copy made it to Redlands and one of our colleagues bought it and came into the office and said, look at this. Mm -hmm. um, interesting this. I mean, it's magnificent in many respects. It's large format. It's eye-catching. It's very detailed uh, down at zip code level. Um, unfortunately, from my perspective, um, they decided to revert to a geographical map. Uh, remember, in Britain, the Independent did the same thing. They were happy with cartograms online, but in print, they went with the geographical version. Um, that's a kind of interesting thing. Um, but what amused me is um, on Twitter, <laughs> which is the best place for any review of anything, obviously, um, this, I haven't photoshopped this. this was a, I took this, um, and these two arrived at exactly the same time. This is Brian Timoney at the top, taking a similar view to me, and then underneath it, a guy who works at Ordnance Survey in the UK. That's really cool. So, you know, you, you, it doesn't, you tend to get opinions as well as whether you think a map is actually purporting one version of the truth or another. Um, there were some pretty bad maps. Uh, this is the, this is the, <laughs> well, if you've never seen it, you can try and work out what that's saying. Uh, but the key to that is it's wrong on so many levels. <laughs> <laughs> it's my time up yet. Uh, it, pro it, it probably should be. Um, okay, so how, how, have I, how do I deal with this? Well, for the 2012 election, I uh, made a gallery of, uh, I think it was about 22 different maps for the Obama-Romney um, election. And if you go and have, search for the thematic mapping ArcGIS Online Gallery, you'll get to here. And you click on here and you get an example of the map type and there's some notes about the data requirements, the, uh, what it supports, what its problems are, really just as a sort of a, a guide to different mapping styles. Um, someone's going to ask me, have I done it for the 2016 election yet? And the answer is no, I actually can't get my head around the results yet. So I haven't brought myself to update it, but I'm just going to show you some of the maps because they are made. Um, you know, this is standard red-blue. This is an interesting map, uh, which is actually votes for Trump <coughs> as totals. Um, with natural breaks, I think there's five or six classes, which is a fascinating map. And uh, those that do know me will go on about um, how I always talk about normalizing um, data for Coropless. Normalizing by population gives you that map. And I, I, I actually personally don't think I've come across a, any better example, um, I'll just switch back, uh, of the value in normalizing against the population uh, than those two maps. But of course, there's, there's other ways we could do it. Uh, this, is the, this is the map that Trump's got on his wall, this sort of diverging hue share of vote map. Um, we could value by alpha it and um, apply a, a, some sort of muting effect um, for lower popula populated areas. What about an isopleth? We haven't seen many of those. I don't know. You can do them. Um, what about putting the data on the map itself and actually doing a sort of a proportional value by alpha style um, text map. I like these because the data's on the map itself. 
There is no legend because you look at the number and that's the, that's the information right there on the map. And of course, in a multi-scale environment, you can start to reveal more as you, you zoom in. Um, maybe a swingometer map. This works better at a zoomed scale where the uh, symbols are sort of uh, disassociating themselves. So this has coalesced um, a fair bit. I didn't see many of these. This is, this is possibly the crucial information from the last election. These are the flipped counties, and there actually aren't that many. Um, so if you want to sort of dig into the narrative of a particular result and why it happened, then maybe these places are the key to telling that particular story. Uh, the next one I warn you, you probably won't like because I've never known an American audience like a Gassner Newman cartogram. <laughs> you might prefer the dawling. Shall I go back to that one? Because you don't like you know, okay. um, maybe some Maybe some prism maps. Maybe we can put this into the third dimension and actually map population total um, as the, the Z value there. Or maybe we could go to, oops, I beg your pardon, waffle grids look at historical data, or maybe plot these as lines over time. Uh, or maybe we can go back to the beloved hexagon. Um, and this is, um, I'm going to refer to this as the value by alpha dasymmetrically equalized repetition map. <laughs> because it's Vader. <laughs> there we are. Value by alpha dasymmetrically equalized repetition map. There's a lot going on in that. Um, but it was just to get a cheap gag. Um, prob I did do this for the recent elections, though, um, which was up in the gallery, the puzzling presidential election. Um, I'm, I'm, I do like the work of, uh, of Escher, M.C. Escher, the, the Dutch um, artist, artist mathematician, and his, particularly his reptile um, tessellation I particularly like. And I thought, well, I wonder if I can tessellate um, um, Trump and Clinton across this. And I could, and I particularly like the fact that Hillary Clinton's got her sort of left arm jammed. <laughs> um, I used a technique that John Nelson um, uh, showed me on, for putting rope across a map, this idea of dissimilarity between areas to show how your neighbors voted in comparison to you. Thicker rope um, is a larger dissimilarity. And then the final map I, I want to show you is, is the one that's also up in the, the map gallery um, where I, I just ditched the computer. And I didn't get paid for this, just to make it absolutely clear. This was, this was not part of my day job. Uh, and I just got the pens out and started drawing. And it's been a while since I made a hand-drawn map and uh, just because I was so angst-ridden. And I ended up with this. Um, it's really just a serio-comical map or a satirical map. And, of course... Um, it was a cathartic process, and I had fun doing it. The best satire, still from Trump himself, this is, this is referred to as the most, hang on, let me get this right, the more accurate map, okay? Well, it's now at precinct level, so there's, there's more, but accurate? I don't know. But if Trump's retweeting it means it gets eyes on it, so it's visible to a lot of people. Anyway, just to sort of conclude, um, the point is, with um, so many different design choices, fake maps or possibly alternate realities, as I call them, um, are abound. And you can make a map to say anything you want. And people are making them to say anything they want. Um, I'm finding that cartograms still polarize opinion, but more and more people are going for this gridded form of cartogram. Uh, and as I demonstrated, this is, this is not new. This has got a 150-year history. In, uh, in making of maps to demonstrate or present election results. So experimentation continues, innovation exists, none are right, none are wrong, but they all tell very different versions of the truth. Um, and what's my take home? Well, for me, being able to recognize the bias in the map is something I can do and most people in here can do, but it's not really cartographic pedantry, it's, a, it's an important issue because it plays to people's views, their opinions, and their own search for the truth. So that's my little talk, and given that we're live streaming, I'm going to advertise this. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>